It's great to have Trunk Nation back on the patio at the Rainbow. Thank you, everybody. And we have uh, we have a whole different thing going on here now because we have a whole section that we didn't have the last time because the driveway is now a seating area. So we have about, I mean, I think we have about double or triple the amount of people we've ever had here for a broadcast. So thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate it. It's great to be back. And for those that are newer listeners, uh, I was doing a broadcast from here at the Rainbow every month on the patio with all sorts of great guests. And then COVID hit and took the whole thing down. And that's been about a couple of years. And here we are. And we're finally back. So many people have been asking me when you're going to bring the shows back from L.A. from the Rainbow. And we are doing it. And we're doing it in a big way because we are tying in with another great event that is happening here tonight which is a celebration for the late, great Ronnie James Dio, everybody. Let's hear it for Ronnie. Yeah. I see a lot of uh, Dio shirts in the uh, audience here already. The Dio has a lot of history here. Wendy is here, and we're going to be talking to her in just a minute. Wendy used to work here, so maybe she can get me a discount on a pizza later. <laughs> Wendy, you have any pull here still? You have any juice anymore or no? No? No. So we'll see. We'll talk to Wendy in a little bit. We've got great guests. On cue, Sebastian Bach walked in just as we were coming on the air. And I think Sebastian would have been here whether we were doing the show anyway, because it's Sebastian and we're going to hang and we're going to have a good time. And he's a regular listener of the show, as everybody knows, and appreciate him being here. We have a lot of other guests. I see Vinny Apice right in the, somewhere. Vinny's somewhere around here. Vinny's, Vinny's in the back row. How'd you get in the back? The drummers always get screwed, Vin. The drummers always get screwed. <laughs> we got a seat for you in the front. We're going to get Vinny up on the stage in a little bit. We'll be talking to him as well. Tons of guests. We're going to be here for the next couple hours celebrating Ronnie James Dio, celebrating what would have been his 80th birthday, and celebrating the re-release of the classic first Dio album, Holy Diver which is out today in a brand new special edition. I received a copy of it already. It's amazing. It's incredible booklet, incredible liner notes. And there's four CDs in the CD version, which of course is the one I got. And you've got a live concert on there. You've got a bunch of B-sides. You've got the original album remastered. And then you've got the album remixed by one of the leading guys mixing records today, Joe Barisi. And Joe is here, and we're going to talk to him about tackling that project and his approach to it. So we're going to cover a lot of Dio stuff, a lot about Ronnie, and a lot about Holy Diver, which is actually next year, I guess, going to be 40? 40 years old already, which is just insane. But it still sounds as good as when it first came out. It really does. Both the original and the new remix, which is out today, and people can get in various configurations. So a great celebration for a guy that we all loved and we all miss terribly, but is, all, is always still very much with us through his music and how kind he was to his fans and his friends. Uh, Ronnie James Dio, that's what it's about tonight, everybody. So one more time, let's hear it for Ronnie as uh, we celebrate him and raise him up to him tonight at the Rainbow. Here she is, the, the woman that really put this all together, because before this was even a radio broadcast, this was still a celebration for Ronnie and also a celebration for the re-release of Holy Diver. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for Wendy Dio, everybody. So, Wendy, here we are again. We've had, and I, I tell you this every time, I'm so grateful that you have me included in all these great events since we lost Ronnie so many great celebrations for him. Tell me about the idea to do what you've done with Holy Diver and have it remixed and have it re-released in this special edition, which just came out. Where did the idea come from? Well, the idea actually came from Rhino, who suggested that we remix the record. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then I said, well, if we're gonna do that, I need the choice of picking who I want. And I did some research and then I found that Joe Barishi was the man I wanted. And he did not disappoint. It is in your face. And I'll tell you, Ronnie would have been really proud of what he did with it. I am so excited about it and I'm so proud of it. And I'm really, really grateful for everything. Yep. 
Yeah, it's really a very uh, cool alternate version of it. And of course, the original mix, which is also fantastic and holds up so well, uh, that's still included in the package in a remastered edition. That's still in there. And then we have also a live uh, mix version by Wynn Davis, a longtime uh, friend and engineer of Ronnie's. And uh, he uh, did that one with the, that was a Fresno show from 1983, a Holy Diver, and that's in there. Oh, there's all kinds of, and then Joe found all these outtakes, which he put included in there too. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of different stuff out the vault. The interesting thing in listening to the Fresno show is that Ronnie says something to the crowd about Fresno being the place that really first embraced Dio. Can you talk a little bit about that? What was the history there? Well, you know, in the beginning, uh, we went to a lot of very out of the way places. <laughs> like Antioch, I think was the first, uh, well, the first show was in Antioch, which is like a, a cow barn. We didn't think anyone was going to come, but it was packed. And then Fresno was another one. They're like bee markets, but, you know, they give you those ones to go out, first of all, just in case you pull in three people. Um, but well, they were all packed and it was great. But it, it was a fun, a fun show. And I have forgotten we even had it. We found it in the vault, you know. So Wynn Davis found it in the vault. Can you talk a little bit about the, the scenario at the time Holy Diver was made? Because... Here's Ronnie coming out of two super successful bands that he played a huge role in, Rainbow and Sabbath. And now here comes Holy Diver. And what I found really interesting in reading the liner notes in the reissue is that you talk about in there that you basically had to like sell a house or more, do a mortgage on a house yeah, yeah. in order to make the record and to do this. And I found that amazing because here he is coming out of Rainbow and Sabbath, but we're... The, the money not made that we would think well, at that he point? Made, he made money in Sabbath, but to go out and do a whole, uh, you know, a tour uh, the same way as Sabbath would, Ronnie wanted to do it the same way. He wanted to be the same way as that. So for the tour, we had to mortgage our house for, for to pay for all the, you got buses and trucks and band and crew and hotels and per diems and you name it, you're paying for it. And, and you know, everybody thinks, oh, there's so much money made, but there's so much money that goes out, especially if you want to do the show that Ronnie wants you to do. And, he, and you talk about the evolution of the band coming together which really began, and we're going to talk to Vinny in a minute, but it really began with Ronnie and Vinny, right? Yeah. That was mm -hmm. the catalyst, yeah. which mm -hmm. makes sense, the two of them coming out of Sabbath together. Right, exactly. Yeah, but Ronnie, uh, Ronnie uh, left Sabbath and asked Vinny if he would join him, and he, and he did. And then they, uh, Ronnie called Jimmy Bain, who had played with him in Rainbow and was a really good friend, uh, to ask him if he knew any bass players, and Jimmy just assumed it was him. So it was. <laughs> <laughs> and it's discussed also that there were a few guitar players that had been auditioned and that yeah. had been considered before Vivian was decided. Can you talk about that process a little bit? Yes, um, there was a, a few different people that Ronnie, um, they came down and they played. I think Jackie Lee was one. And um, um, they said John Sykes was considered Sykes, by Jimmy, yeah. but, but he had actually already taken the... Thin Lizzy gig, I right, think. Right, exactly. Yeah. So there's a few others. Ronnie really wanted a British player. That's he, he had his heart set on a British player, and that's what he got. There's actually a, something in the liner notes on it that says he's such an Anglophile that he actually married a British woman. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you meet here at the Rainbow? You yes, and Ronnie? I did. Yes, did. Because I, I mentioned at the top of the show that you were a waitress here. I was a waitress here. Yes, I was. Wendy can get you extra cheese on the pizza at no charge if you want. I don't know if I have an inch clout now. <laughs> that was many moons ago. Yes, I met him. I was introduced to him by Richie Blackmore, who is here. Um, and uh, I knew Richie and I knew uh, his wife, Babsy. And they were having a party up at their house in Hollywood Hills. And he said, would you like to come up? And I said, sure, OK. And I went up there and he kept pushing Ronnie on me. I said, well, he's a bit short for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he persisted and uh, we started going out and then he went on tour. He had made the album, the first Richie Blackmore's Rainbow album, but had not toured yet. He went on tour for a couple of weeks and they called me and said, uh, 
come and join me, quit your job and come join me. I said, no, I can't quit your job, but I'll come for a couple of weeks. And I came for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And I want to ask you, going back to Holy Diver, was, was the record well-received right out of the gate or did it take a little time to build? Well, the record company really didn't do anything for us because this was a record of Ronnie's, a solo record. So they didn't really care about it. Um, obviously, things have changed. Rhino, Warner Brothers have been absolutely fantastic now. They've got great people there. Rob Gross, Mike, Mark Pinkers, Jason Elsie, and uh, just to name a few. They've got amazing, passionate people now. In those days, they didn't. They didn't care. So um, they didn't really come to do anything for us until... It was happening and, you know, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, went out first of all with Aerosmith. Um, Aerosmith were not in good shape at that time. And then the record just jumped up the charts and it was just like amazing. I think we only did 10 shows with Aerosmith and then it was on their own. And the record was done very quickly, right? It was done at Sound City oh, yeah, here in Sound L.A. City, yep. And it was done in, in under a month, right? That's right. Yep. Yep. And, and done pretty much live to tape, was it? Yes. For the most part? Yep. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's still, it's amazing. And it still has that feel and that sound. But we're going to talk more about Holy Diver again. Uh, as you're listening to this, it's out today, this special, amazing reissue with all these great extras, incredible packaging, all ha hallmarks of Rhino. Rhino always does amazing reissues. And this one is absolutely no exception. And you can get it, I, the, four, the four CD version, which is what I have. And there's a vinyl version as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And is there any other configurations? Those are the two right now. There's no super deluxe or there's a super deluxe. Get, put the mic up. Super deluxe versions with the live show. There's a lot of B sides that they've used from singles. Oh, there's a lot of stuff they pulled out from the vault and the outtakes, of course. Yeah, it's really, really great. Now, before we continue and bring up some more guests, I do have to ask you real quickly about something that I've already been lucky enough to see, and that is the coming Dio documentary which is absolutely incredible. And myself, Wendy, Geezer Butler, Sebastian, we were all at South by Southwest where you screened it very recently. Can you get, since I've been on the air talking about it, everybody keeps saying to me, how can I see it? When can I see it? Can you give any update on the distribution of the film? Okay, so uh, I can't say who right now because we haven't signed the papers, but it will be coming to theaters uh, at the end of summer. It will definitely be, and uh, it's going out to, so we're very, very excited about it. It'll be in theaters first, and then it'll be streaming, and then it'll be Blu-rays and, and everything else. So we're really excited about it. And then Warner Brothers is doing the soundtrack. And there is a TV, uh, you can't say it yet, but there is a TV deal for it as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So yeah, there's yeah, going to yeah. be a lot of ways you can mm -hmm. see this. But I will say this, having been lucky enough to see it in a proper movie theater with the sound cranked up on a big screen, when it hits theatrically, if you can see it that way, you should, because yeah. it's it's a great way to yeah. see it. It's a great story. It's, a gr it's, it's amazing. I wish I could say more right now, but... I only got the news today, so I <laughs> so I'm very excited. But it's coming now at the end of summer for sure. Yeah, it's uh, so you're thinking maybe September, October, people yep, have a chance yep, to see yep, it. Yep, yep. And anything else as far as um, material coming out that's in the archives? Will you do this with Last in Line? Yes, Rhino wants to do that in uh, I think 2024. Oh, okay. Yep. So. They it, already have that in the works. And then uh, BMG has uh, some, uh, for record store day, they have Dio at Donington, 1983, 1987. And I'm curious about this. You know, since we lost Ronnie, you have done so much incredible work with the Dio Cancer Fund and the fundraising events and so many things to keep his spirit, his memory, his music out there. In Ronnie's final days, did you have a conversation with him about this? Did he did he talk to you a little bit about how he would have liked his legacy or did it not go in that direction? No, no. When Ronnie passed away, I made a vow to myself that I would keep his music and his legend alive as much as I could. And that's my that's my lot in life right now is to keep his memory and his music alive. And speaking of the Dio Cancer Fund events which I've been honored to host all of them. 
Are we going to bowl this year? We're bowling this We're year. We're bowling. Oh, my bowling. gosh. November Finally. 17th. We can say the date. Yeah, November 17th at Pins. In Studio yeah. City, right? Studio City, that's it. All right, we're back. Pins in Studio City, the DO Charity Bowling. It's You can't imagine what goes on at this thing. <laughs> my teams every year are like a who's who uh, from, you know, Dave Grohl to Jack Black to Steven Adler to you name it. Uh, Sebastian did it. Baz did it. And then we had some crazy party at Baz's house afterwards <laughs> when he lived up the street. Uh, it was it was <laughs> he's ready to have another one tonight. Uh, but that that's so great that those are going to be coming back. So Dio Bowling returns. Yeah, and hopefully the ride for Ronnie the following year. So, yep, we're working. We're back on track. That's awesome. Uh, go to DioCancerFund.org to learn more about the amazing work that Wendy and her team does to help those with cancer in the name of Ronnie, which, of course, is why he's not with us anymore because of that horrible disease. So anything you can do to help the Cancer Fund and help others is always very, very good. All right, we've got a panel up here now. And we're going to start with uh, the first person to Wendy's right. He is uh, one of my favorite drummers, and you know him from countless bands, including Black Sabbath. And of course, Dio, the one and only Vinnie Apice, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hey, how about that Dio jacket on Stranger Things? Right? Everyone's talking about this Stranger Things show, and I couldn't get into it. Am I the only one? Did you see Sunset Boulevard? There's about 20 Stranger Things billboards. And apparently all the way down. Metallica had Master of Puppets in there, and that's like flying again. It's just crazy. Uh, all right, we're going to talk to everybody here in a second about everything, but let me just introduce everybody. Next to Vinny, we have the guy who had the task of remixing this classic record, and you will hear his mix if you pick up the new issue, the reissue of Holy Diver, which is... Out now, Joe Barisi, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. Thank Just you. found out you're originally a Staten Island guy. Joe, little Joey Barisi from Staten Island. That's what they call me. <laughs> how, how long have you been in L.A.? Oh, uh, man, my first job was Sound City, 1988. Sound City, where, of course, Holy Diver was recorded. Every, every day I walked in there, I saw, well, I should probably bet everybody in, in D.O. back in the day. Is that right? And saw the platinum album on the wall every day of my life. But we're definitely going to get into some stories there. And uh, the, yeah. the guy on the end here is, uh, if you when you see the Dio documentary, you're going to realize how insanely cool this is. So one of the biggest, I don't want to give away too much about the documentary, but one of the biggest revelations about the documentary was that the Holy Diver album cover, which I always thought was just a painting of that somebody came up with that in their head, was actually a photograph that was taken by Gene Kirkland, who is here with us right here. Gene, give him a round of applause. And there's an amazing reenactment in the documentary. Gene, talk about that. You actually took a guy and put him in chains and put him in the ocean. You almost drowned someone for the cover. I can't believe you actually did that. It's Wendy's idea. It, 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 was it your idea, Wendy? It was. Oh. Uh -oh. No. <laughs> Wendy and Ronnie had the concept. So it started from there. Um, I got a phone call from Gene Hunter. He was the guy that called me. Okay. He called me one Saturday in the middle of the... No, he called me on Friday night saying that Wendy gave him my phone number and that he wanted to be realistic as he was doing the actual album. And so- So he, this is, let me, let me get this straight. So this is the guy that was gonna paint it. Yes. So yes. he needed a photo to work he, off. Yes, so he wanted realism. So he said, Wendy gave him my phone number and to do whatever she said. <laughs> so with that being said, I get a phone call Friday night in November of 82. And he said, I'm going to get some stuff together. You can and, say shit. Okay. Get, yeah. get some shit stuff together. Yeah. And, and so to come by his place on Saturday morning, the next day, and bring your camera, of course, because that's the reason why, and take some photographs because he has this idea, but he needs realism. And so I'm like, I, I didn't even know what was going on until I picked him up at 10 a.m. on that November cold, rainy morning. And he had a bunch of 
stuff and he threw it in the back of my dad's pickup and there was chains there was uh he had a, a little bag that had a priest outfit a full <laughs> priest outfit and um a few uh, i think a makeshift cross that he was going to try to put together and i just was so overwhelmed the fact that i was even doing this and wendy dio said you know go Wendy, do this were you there when this went down as the manager you weren't supervising this no supervision whatsoever <laughs> oh my gosh so so you actually put so for people th th this just blew my mind the the photo actually happened you actually put a guy in the ocean here in chains in a priest outfit i was just there you were just there but no, you no. photographed yeah, it yeah so so um gene hunter his name um, we found a spot in, I think it's Pacific Palisades in um, Los Angeles in, in this hilly area. He, he already knew what he wanted. So he said, how far can your truck go? And I said, well, as far as we can get it to the ocean. And so we pulled up on the sand. He started getting dressed in this priest outfit and had about, maybe it was about 150 pounds worth of chains and was putting his collar on and i'm taking these black and whites he said i need this in black and white because i'll do the color part but i just need it black and white i need to see the ocean i need to see everything in detail so he got himself in his rig his uh, priest outfit and he started the sachet into the uh, water you gotta you gotta see this in the documentary when you get a chance to see the documentary because it's completely reenacted and it's 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 so crazy that I, it it blew my mind to find out. Now, last question for you at this point: Did do you have the photos? I have been looking for these photos oh. since I turned them over to Gene. Now, when I turned them over to him, I haven't seen him since two days after I got him developed. I looked at him and I go, "Oh crap, he was going to die. I mean, he was like going to drown." I only took two rolls of black and white film before he he. I don't know if you wore 175 pounds of chains and in going into the water, but that's not an easy thing to do. So he went in and I took the photos and um, gave it to him. And that's the last I've seen of those photos or you, him. Why didn't you email me? Vinny, put the mic up so we can hear you. Vinny. Email what? Whose email? <laughs> oh, email. email. I said, why don't you email them to Wendy so we had <laughs> extra copies? What's an email? What's a cell phone? Back in 80. Yeah. <laughs> Before the internet. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, um, I haven't, I, I got to see the photos for a day after yeah. I got them developed, turned them over to him. He disappeared and the photos disappeared. Yeah. Wow, amazing story. Um, Joe, let, let's get to you now. Tell me your thoughts when you were approached about remixing such a classic record. Well, I mean, I didn't really want to F it up personally. So I, you can I, say f it up. I, all right. I didn't want to f it up. So I, I I grew up listening to I still have an original pressing and it's one of my favorite records of all time. And I'm like, what can you do to make this better? And Ronnie isn't here to say, you know, I'd like this or I like that. Or I don't like this, whatever. So I I really I, when I talked to Wendy, I, I just thought, well, first of all, let's get everything transferred. We found all this extra outtakes and uh, and just as as the songs were developing, what you guys were jamming, there was listening to that and getting into that framework. I also, Wendy, Wendy sent me the book, which put my mind into that in framework. And I, grew, I worked at Sound City for years. So I, I basically had to teleport myself back into 1983 and decided that I wouldn't do anything that I would never do that I, that I wouldn't want to hear. I just wanted to hear the solos a little bit more. I wanted to hear more drum stuff. So I, and, you know, I want to make sure, make it modern, but not make people disappointed when they bought it. So um, I, it really was, um, it, it wasn't even really that much of a challenge, honestly, because the songs are so good. You can mix all day long and hear the same song a hundred times and you never actually think I'm working right now. You're just listening to Ronnie sing differently, listening to Vinny do these fills that are phenomenal. That The other thing is I wanted to keep all the intros and outros wide open because the songs all fade on the record so now you actually hear endings you hear these guys listening to each other in a room playing and it was that was the thing that that beyond the guitar tone and the drums a little bit that was the thing that really jumped out at me about it which i thought was so cool right like when you guys hear this remix that joe did the song holy diver now has a cold ending it doesn't fade you hear this big finish ending to it 
and you did that on a few tracks where you left some extra did, stuff I, in I there. I did it on all of them. I didn't fade one song because I wanted everybody to hear something different. This is how it really ended, you know, and, the, and, and some of the outtakes will blow your mind because Ronnie's got the metronome in his vocal mic when they're starting a song and you can hear them get to that tempo and the, the sound of the drums through his vocal mic and then the, the camaraderie, you know, and then and I also love the fact that Ronnie used Angelo to do this record and not pick some, you know, person who was a, a high dollar producer or whatever. He wanted a guy who knew his band and Angelo captured it. And I didn't I wanted to do that justice, too. So I, I you know, my assistant June uh, here, we cut the CD up and matched everything to the transfers of the tapes so we could make sure the delays were exactly the same and the reverb tails were the same. And we used stuff that they would have done in 1983, 1982. I mean, there's there's a, a great story where there's, you know, when you have a 24 track tape, first of all, there's harmonies and some of the harmonies don't exist. And the harmonies were done in mixing with a harmonizer. So there's a, a harmony on the word hell. It sounds like the devil. And I'm sitting there with a 949, which would have been the same harmonizer they used in 83 in Sound City and dialing it back and back and back until it finally hit the number 666. And I thought, <laughs> you know, this is, this is something I would have done in the studio too. So it, it was actually, it was, it was a dream actually, as, a, as a, of all the records I've worked on, it's one of the things that I just go as a crowning achievement. And we should mention Angelo for those listening is Angelo Arcuri, who was Ronnie's sound guy for live shows and still is around, still does some front of house stuff. I used to see him in Vegas when he lived there. And he mixed the, the record, which is actually, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, doing this uh, as a pro that you are, it's pretty unusual for an artist to use their, their live sound guy to work on records, right? Right, right. so I think, I think Ronnie had the foresight to know that he wanted to do something different. And he, you know, the, the, he trusted Angelo to get the sound of the band. Oh, then get on the mic. On. Angelo and I grew up in Brooklyn together. All right. We didn't go to school together. We stayed outside school because we knew where we <laughs> you went to, to the do. school, but you just didn't, didn't go finish in. high school. But um, Angelo was also the live sound man for Black Sabbath. All right. Oh, he was mixing Sabbath on when you were in the band. Yes. I didn't know that. Yes, he yeah. did. He, he wow. started out as my drum check, drum tech, and then he wound up doing sound for Sabbath. And then we all got along great. And then Ronnie decided that uh, make this move. Angelo, you want to come with us? And that's how he got involved. Yeah, it was a fresh start. Yeah, it, was, it yeah. totally makes sense. Right. And Joe, one last question for you before we get to Vinny. When, the, you worked off the original masters? Yeah, we we took the tapes. They transferred the tapes. Um, and we, I mean, you're literally listening to the the actual recordings, the actual amount of tracks, there, which was barely 24 tracks on most of these songs, which is unheard of these days. I mean... It's not uncommon to mix a, an album now that has hundreds, if not <laughs> thousands of tracks. And here it is, Jimmy Bain with one bass track that sounds like the most amazing bass sound I've ever heard, where I strive to get a bass sound that good, much less on one track. And and to hear like how guys listen to each other play, like how Vivian would pick up on your fills or how you might pick up on how Ronnie sang something or how there might be an extra hit or something and Ronnie would crack a joke or, you know, just... It was it was phenomenal to hear the banter in between. So I'm glad that some of that is on the on the box. What now. what kind of condition was the actual tape in? Did it have to be baked or anything, or was the tape, it in good the shape? Tapes are baked, and they um, the the label transferred everything. Um, you know, there were there were some issues in the first round of transfers, so we were pretty adamant about going back and doing it again. And and some of them were in different sample rates, and so they they actually once once. You know, we mentioned that this this is holy diver for God's sake. We're gonna make this happen. You're gonna go back and retransfer this stuff, and and they they did a great job. The, the notes were very detailed, and um, it's actually to see the mixed notes was actually even funnier because it was all mixed manually in Sound City. So there mm -hmm. there would be stuff where there's actually bass on some songs that doesn't exist on these songs where they'd mute it while they're mixing. Those things I didn't keep in because they weren't supposed to be in the mix, but to be able to hear that stuff was phenomenal and, there, and to see the notes and all those notes from the tape boxes were photographed and photocopied and sent over as well. So, Vin, having been so instrumental in Ronnie's life and music and this period in particular, because it was you really you and him coming out of Sabbath that went and put this whole thing together. 
and went around and got Jimmy and found Vivian and all of that. But what, this being a record you're a big part of, what are your thoughts about listening to Joe's remix? Uh, well, what's they fun- better be nice. He's sitting right next to you. You're a New York guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I'm, not not it. oh, hey. I'm from Brooklyn. Hey, <laughs> let's go get a bagel. <laughs> Um, the, uh, did you send him a 20 in the mail and say, turn the drums up a little more? I didn't, Wendy wouldn't give me his email or his, <laughs> or his number or anything like that. Uh, yeah. You know, when we did the record, well, I, the only thing I heard was Holy Diver on YouTube, just the end of it. And then I heard that ending. I went, there's no ending on Holy Diver. Right. And what that is, it's, we goofed around on a lot of songs and played, even live at sound checks and stuff, the 2001. Down, down, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah, that is what bah. it is. And yeah. it was a joke because we, we had enough rollout to fade. And I always do this. I'll go double time. I'll go crazy. I'll go 7 4. I'll play fills all over because I know we're out. You know, never thought we'd use that 40 years later we use it and i hear that i go you got to be kidding that was a joke <laughs> but i must say it was very tight you know you down 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 so i was really surprised but that's what makes it you here invisible yeah wait you here invisible the beginning of invisible you know what that is right uh ronnie wanted something to sound invisible so we smoked a lot of pot on this record <laughs> can i say that it's legal now back then you could have got smoking a lot of pot it. here we smoked a lot of pot and uh we're in there that night and we go we need it ronnie wanted to sound like you know an invisible sound no computers back then so we're sitting there and i'll friend tom who actually brought us the pot goes hey i got a tire in my truck <laughs> really and we bring it in we'll let the air out so we brought the tire in angelo mic the tire i think it was the first time that somebody mic'd a tire and then ronnie was coordinating it and go okay you ready they rolled the tape <laughs> he had a screwdriver and that's the beginning of invisible that's awesome. I think he overdubbed it too. And it's Joe, twice. Joe, on the beat, on the uh, the intro piece to the song "Holy Diver," when I listen to that, tell me if I'm crazy, but is that a little louder? Did you do anything in that with that intro piece at all? I, um, well, I, I got to be honest that that was really difficult to make sound as good as the album. So I kind of added to what was on the album. So if that makes sense, I, I, you know, I mean, it's trying to figure out where there's so many, and there's 24 tracks of instruments happening. So you have to try to figure out what comes in, what comes out. Did they use this part? Did they use this sound? So it was very forensic in trying to get it. And then to make it, I think in mastering nowadays, mastering in general is louder. So, so everything got evened out a little more. Um, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time trying to preserve the integrity of it and not make it sound like, a modern right. hi-fi, you know, super loud record, but it, it got a bump up in level, but it, I think it still has a lot of depth and it still Atmosphere. has a lot of low end. It's that it's, yeah. it sounds great on, on a stereo to me, regardless of if it's, if it's streamed or not. It's that was, that was all Ronnie to playing the keyboards. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Vin, take us back to making that record with Ronnie. You guys are both coming out of Sabbath. I would and and we all know that the way it ended for Sabbath with Ronnie initially on that first turnaround was not necessarily on the best of terms. Was there a was there a real extra spark and extra drive that here he is now stepping out under his own name with a new band to really lay down the gauntlet? Well, actually, it's fitting that we're here because uh, after the uh, tour, uh, we did the Live Evil album recorded live and we were mixing that. Then we came here to have some drinks and some food, probably a pizza. And Ronnie said to me, hey, look, I'm leaving the band. And uh, so it was here at the Rainbow where he asked me if I wanted to join him with his new band. 
And I went, oh, okay. But it was kind of a no brainer here. How exciting is this? The best killer singer in rock. We're going to start a band together from scratch. And uh, I mean, Sabbath, you know, I'm honored to play with Black Sabbath, Tony and Geezer. But this was sounded like something really exciting. And we can build it from the beginning and, and see what happens. So, and you know, I was in my 20s. You're in your 20s, you don't weigh it too much you know two great choices but uh and then we wound up uh in ronnie's at the garage playing that 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 was the first riff we had is that right yeah that was the first thing that that you heard and ronnie ronnie those, played guitar oh he did because we know we know he played a lot of instruments even though he didn't play them live but he did not but, but he wrote he wrote the riff to holy diver on guitar yeah, he had the riff and then we started jamming and we put in some accents and and we we built it from there. We didn't have the solo. We we only went like two verses out. Then we auditioned guitar players in L.A. Talk about that, if you will, because that's interesting. That went through a little process, right? You went here. You were here in L.A. and then you went to England. Yeah, we were like the original White Stripe, me and Ronnie, <clears throat> guitar and, and, and he switched the bass sometimes and drums. Uh, so then we auditioned. He said, all right, we're going to get some people down. And uh, we got a bunch of guitar players down, but it, nothing really, really gelled. We even had Jakey Lee come down. Jakey Lee came down. He was great. But then I think it was in the back of Ronnie's mind to have a, a European flavored band. And uh, so he, we decided, yeah, that sounds like the plan. So we went to England. We went to London. We, Ronnie and I stayed in the same room. You know, which is funny because he's up till three in the morning reading books with the light on. And I'm going, I can't sleep with the light on. <laughs> it was like the odd couple. <clears throat> it was great. And we went to a couple of clubs in London to see bands. One of them, we walk in. <laughs> it's a reggae band. I go, I don't think that's a guitar player. Right. Yeah, dreadlocks and the whole bit. So uh, then we waited for Jimmy Bain to come back. Jimmy came back into town and... Uh, we call Vivian's house in Ireland, and um, he flew over the next day. We jammed, and we recorded it on a little cassette plate uh, tape. And then Ronnie and I went back to the hotel later that night. We probably went for an Indian meal or something and listened to the tape, and we were blown away. Wow, this is great. And Jimmy, I don't know. Jimmy just came along with... The package. Right? Well, Wendy, you, Wendy, gra jump in here because you talked about J Jimmy kind of just. He just assumed he was going to be the bass player. <laughs> you know, it was like Jimmy was like Jimmy Bob Bain. That was that was his Jimmy name. Bob Bain. Jimmy he Bob don't Bain. Care. He was just there and he was going to be the bass player. That's when I it. walked into Sound City, the first rehearsal, right, I walk in. Jimmy's sleeping in front of my drums on the drum riser at the edge of the stage. <laughs> I go to look at Ronnie. I go. Is he okay? Should we call 911? Or he goes, no, nah, it's fine. And then he got up and just played and <laughs> it was fine. And for those that don't know it, the late Jimmy Bain was is actually the guy that came up with the very hooky keyboard part to Rainbow in the Dark, right? Yeah. yeah. He walked over, we had the song, so we were playing it on the cassette tape. Uh, and then Jimmy has a cigarette in his hand and a Jim Beam and Coke. And he walks over to the keyboard, puts a cigarette in his mouth, and there's a big ash, nothing fell. And he goes, that, 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 that riff, a rainbow in the dark. And we're like, wow, let's record it. We did it again. Still didn't drop an ash from a cigarette. <laughs> and that's how that got on the song. And let me ask you about the opening track on the record. Ronnie used to always tell me that he got a lot of inspiration to writing lyrics from watching sports. We were big sports fans, Ronnie and I, I still am. And we would always argue about sports because I was a, I'm a Mets fan. He was a Yankees fan and we bonded over the giants, but we differed on baseball. So we would always argue about that, but stand up and shout to me, although the immediate connotation is stand up and shout at a rock show. Ronnie had told me that actually was someone inspired from watching sports. Do you remember that song coming together? Well, the song, the music of the song was actually from Vivian's old band called Sweet Savage. Sweet Savage. Right. And that riff, that, 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 that was in the song. 
So we listened to it and we liked the riff, but we didn't like the rest of the song. So we started working on the song and then Ronnie came up with the idea of stand up and shout, maybe from, like you said, the sports thing. And uh, then we made it work. And then we did the breakdown in the middle, stand up and shout, Oy! you know, all that stuff. Oi, <clears throat> yeah. Ronnie always said, oi. Oi, he loves oi's. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't Jewish. Oi. <laughs> so that's how that came about. You know, uh, it came from that song, but we tore it apart, used the riff and uh, built that song up. And then uh, all those things were recorded without a click. It's no click, as you probably noticed. And uh, no cut and paste anything. You go, you ready? Everybody's ready? Because what happened in Sound City, we built the hut out of plywood. We actually all went to Home Depot and bought eight sheets of four by eight plywood, put a floor down, then we built a hut, a roof. So the drums were in a wooden container and I had a window. It was no window in there, but I could see Ronnie. I could see the rest of the band. And that's how we recorded that. So it was, uh, we got warmed up and then we, especially stand up and shout it's a fast song once we were really warmed up and sweating then it's like all right let's do it let me play the whole thing let me get it before we we go because i could talk about the record forever and so many great songs on it but before we uh we run out of time with with you guys vin tell me about the tour because wendy and i talked about a little bit at the top you played everywhere and anywhere tell me about the tour how it started and how it progressed it was great there was money everywhere and uh, <laughs> you being sarcastic, <laughs> pediums were fabulous. Flying private, then? Yeah, I didn't know where the money came from. <laughs> no, the tour was uh, we started the first gig was Antioch, California, right? And it was a warm up show. So we we rehearsed and everything, but we didn't have the endings down very well. So we go, well, it's Antioch, California. There's probably be a couple hundred people up there and we'll run it through. Yeah. So we get up there, we do a sound check. Then we go back in there. It was like a trailer thing. Then we look out as people come in and the place is packed. It's 3000 people there. Oh no, we better play good. And uh, <laughs> tickets were 10 bucks and the endings were like, is it now? Uh, we're looking at each other. No, wait, wait, one more time. Let me relax for a minute. Now, boom. It was that kind of thing the whole night. And uh, we did a lot of medleys. Ronnie liked medleys going from heaven and hell to another song. And we had to remember all this stuff. So it was funny. The endings just went on and on and on and on. Well, you only had an, an, an essentially a new band, but you only had one record of material to play. So you had to play Rainbow and Sabbath stuff, right? We played, uh, yeah, Sabbath stuff. We played Children of the Sea, Heaven and Hell, the Neon Nights. We played Man on a Silver Mountain, Long Live Rock and Roll and uh, played everything. And it was fun. It was a variety of, of Ronnie's, Ronnie's stuff. And did you see an immediate change when Rainbow and the Dark hit in the amount of people, the song, when the amount of people were coming out to the shows? Was there a big spike? Because MTV, early days of MTV, they started hitting that video. I'm sure a lot changed. Yeah, the quick. video was on. And then uh, <clears throat> I used to drive around the valley. I lived in the valley near Ronnie and, and Wendy. <clears throat> hear rainbow in the dark on the radio and all the time and uh so the tour went from we had a couple of shows with aerosmith but ronnie hated opening up for aerosmith said I don't she had to deal with that who were in bad shape at the time too the aerosmith so we did one show and on that show joe perry and steven tyler got in a fist fight on stage <laughs> <clears throat> i mean a real fist fight <clears throat> and ronnie said that's it and uh wendy was able to pull together quickly a tour of theaters and we had queens right open for us <clears throat> and that was a great show the places were full it was packed we did that for about two months and then the albums climbing the charts and then we were in arenas it was amazing it's like a typical rock story you know like so the holy diver tour ended wendy with the band headlining arenas i mean that's a really quick ascent because even though ronnie had huge name value still coming out of rainbow sabbath as anybody that knows when you leave an established band and start a new one you're still really starting from the ground up you got to build the base so that had to feel amazing to even geezer butler 
sent a message. He said, I knew you guys would make a good album or Gloria said, but I didn't know you're going to make that good of an album. <laughs> Is it? It was on par with what we were coming from. Somewhat. Well, that good of an album is now available in a special edition, which we touched on before. It's out now. Uh, you get the original record. You get the Joe Barisi remix, which we talked about. You get the Gene Kirkland almost drowning a guy photo. Uh, of course, the classic cover. So you got to you gotta get this amazing uh, reissue, which, again, is out now on Rhino. <laughs> CD, vinyl, whatever your preference. So check it out. Amazing stories. We have other guests to get to. Uh, Gene, Joe, Vinny, Wendy, thank you very much. So we've got a, a new panel up here. We're going through different metal panelists here. This is awesome. Uh, joining me right now, well, uh, all three of these folks have played in the Dio band at one point in Ronnie's career. On keyboards, who also did work with Ronnie when he was in Sabbath under Heaven and Hell. On keyboards here, Mr. Scott Warren. Good to see you, Scott. Hello, Eddie. And uh, next him, Ronnie's longtime drummer and a guy that also played in a band you may have heard of called ACDC and a band that I, I kind of heard of called UFO. <laughs> Simon Wright over here. Good to see you, Simon. How you doing, all right? And I remember when this guy got the gig so in much. Dio and everyone was talking about Ronnie just hired this guy that's like nine years old to play guitar for Dio. <laughs> and now he looks like he's about 15 years old. 16. 16, maybe. But, he, but here's Rowan Robertson from the Dio album Lock Up the Wolves joining us. Good to see you, Rowan. Speak, Rowan, so everybody can hear your voice. Hi, hey, Eddie. How, how are, are you? Man? Good I'm to good. see you. Nice to see you. Let's see. For real, how old were you when you got the gig? Uh, I was actually 10. <laughs> I was 17. You were 17. Yeah. And you got picked to be Ronnie's guitarist. Tell that story. I know you have in the past, but. Um, well, I read in Kerrang! magazine that uh, um, they needed a guitar player because Craig Goldie was no longer in the group. And I decided to send a tape and I sent it to the record company. And I, I took a four track recorder and I recorded Holy uh, Last in Line, a solo to Last in Line. And I sent the tape and they sent it back to me. So I found the fan club address in the US. I sold it, uh, sent it over and they eventually, Wendy called me up and they eventually brought me out into audition. And we all know and have established that Ronnie is partial to the Brits and loves the Brits. Lucky Did that accent me. help you a little bit? Yeah, lucky for me. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like joining such a, an icon like Dio at 17? What was that experience like? And were your parents OK mm. with it? Yeah, my parents were OK with it. I had nothing to compare it against. So it was like, oh, this is how life goes. This is all right. This is cool. <laughs> how much <laughs> had you done? <laughs> how much had you done prior to that? Music nothing, like? nothing. I played in like a couple of pubs. And th this is long before the days of like now, you know, you put something on YouTube, you see some kid playing. Hey, let's let that kid got the gig. I mean, yeah. this is this is sending the tape. And yeah, it was like a fairy story. Suddenly it was like from from uh, like my bedroom in, in Cambridge in school uh, to like wild parties in Los Angeles and, and just like lots of hangovers. You were <laughs> Greta Van Fleet before Greta Van Fleet. You realize that, right? I, I was. Uh, I said you were Greta Van Fleet before Greta Van Fleet because they're young kids too. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, <laughs> you broke, they owe me money. They owe you money, exactly. <laughs> um, Simon, I, I was trying to think of this, and I because you have such a long history with Dio, I'm trying. I was trying to remember where it very first started. Where what was the very first moment that you and Ronnie connected and you got in the band or played with them? Well, it, it wasn't too long after uh, I, I moved on from ACDC. It was only about probably about two months. And uh, my ex-wife at the time kind of knew Wendy and uh, found out something was going on. Vin wasn't happy or whatever. But so I was looking for something to do and uh, it just sort of worked out. You know, I went down, rehearsed and stuff. And uh, we just kind of got along really well. And the next thing um you know i ronnie asked me to keep going and rehearse the new stuff for this new album that was going to be called lock up the walls and so you came in at the same time oh, yeah. as rowan 
Oh, they, they just got beers. They couldn't care less about talking right I know. now. <laughs> I know. Let's, let's let's forget forget that that again. What was the question? Exactly right. <laughs> so you so you and Rowan came in at the same time. Yeah, pretty well. Rowan and uh, who was it? Teddy. Teddy. Because uh, Jimmy Bain had left at that time, too. Um, and I think Claude Schnell had left. Too. Yeah. So when I came in, it was it was Rowan. It was Teddy Cook and it was Jens Johansson. OK. And Jens came in and it was just, who's this guy? You know, it's like, you know, it's just a complete virtuoso, uh, 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 mind blowing musician. You know? and, and you maintained a, a very, very close uh, relationship with Ronnie right up till his his death. You actually lived with him, right? Yeah, there was a few people who lived with him and stuff. Craig uh, lived there for a while, too, while we were recording and stuff and all. But, um, you know, I went through a really bad uh, uh, divorce and I was going out. Well, fuck this. I'm not drumming anymore. I'm going back to England and starting a gardening company or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> flea repellent or something. You know? <laughs> and it was really horrible, you know. Um, but but Ronnie said, no, don't do that. Just keep doing what we're doing and you can come stay at my house to get all figured out. And the next thing I know, it was 14 years later. So, you know, it was like fantastic. Good stuff. I, I stayed with Ronnie as well. Yeah. Uh, just for just for a little while. And, and I was, I had grown a beard at that time and you had a beard. <laughs> Ronnie said, we were enough <laughs> to grow a beard. <laughs> no, this is later on. This is later on. <laughs> Ronnie goes, what is, he says, this is beard aid. Yeah, beer, beer, aid. beer aid. aid. <laughs> or beer aid. <laughs> Scott, when did you come into the picture? I, I'm trying to recall that because you've been around Ronnie and we're part of the bands. And, and I said, as I said, Sabbath as well. So tell me about your connection to getting involved. Well, I came in right, probably right around when Simon left. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and Rowan, because uh, I was here. Ronnie would tell stories about you guys. <laughs> well, we didn't leave, and, and Ronnie yes. kind of moved on to Black Sabbath. Which well, was, oh, that's right. He went to he did enough. the Black Sabbath and came back awesome. <clears throat> to Dio, and then he was Jimmy Bain had gone MIA, MIA, and uh, I guess so. He and he also got Tracy G. I guess, and and, and so then I walked in, and that was the lineup was Jeff Pilson, uh, <clears throat> and. Um, so it was a kind of a new lineup and I was new on the block, new kid on the block. Uh, and Vinny was in the band <clears throat> and that went on for a couple of years. That was strange highways. Right. Yeah. That was when, the- when I rejoined again, it was Tracy G and Scott and uh, it was playing bass. Uh, mm. Larry Dennison. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Think there so. were a lot of people in the deal band. When you think about there it, were. there were way more people than yeah. Then I think uh, people realize, I mean, we're we're mm-hmm. focused on right now the original band and Holy Diver because that's the record that's getting reissued. But if you look at through the arc of the catalog, there were a lot of people and maybe yeah. some records people don't even realize that had come out and many people love, including a record like Lock Up the Wolves and, and others. So there's there's a pretty big family tree, isn't there? Yeah, there is. I mean, you know, for one reason or another, I mean, there was some stupid reasons. There was some health reasons, I think, and stuff. And um, well, one of the funniest things was Larry Dennison, who was the bass yeah, player and stuff, right. because he was like um, in the uh, Jay Leno band. And Jay no. was really cool. No, he wasn't he, in the band. He, he oh. worked at, he worked for Oh, Jay Leno. yeah, that's right, right. Right, but he was the main dude that set up the bands. Yeah, at, at but, Jay, but Jay would love Ronnie. You know, he loved Dio, and he would say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know, two months on the road with, you know, and he could go off on the road with Ronnie, then come back and they'd have, still have his job. Right. Then so Jimmy, it was cool. Yeah. Then Jimmy <laughs> you know. Bain uh, fell out of somewhere and was back. Yeah. And uh, I guess Ronnie just great. couldn't resist because Jimmy was, you know, the original bass player. Right. And he wrote a lot of the songs, too. So uh, I was kind of thrilled about that. I, yeah, you know, me too. I, I, you know, Larry was just, a, you know, cool guy and everything. Good bass player. But when Jimmy came back, it's like, wow, this is going to be cool. Yeah. But he couldn't get his passport. Yeah. So then we had to get somebody else. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> this constant. Well, who's in the band now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jimmy did all the states with us and everything, and he he was on the wagon. He was doing really good, yeah. behaving himself, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> so, but when we went to Europe, we had to use another bass player then, you know, because he he just couldn't get his passport. To I want to I want to go yeah. around the horn here and get something from each of you, since you all shared the stage with Ronnie and shared tours and made music with him starting with you, Rowan, on the end, can you give us, is there one, and I know there's probably way more than one, 
but can you give me one highlight moment for you, whether it was recording or playing or even off the stage and out of the spotlight for you that still resonates and means so much from your time in Dio? It was the beard thing, right? The beard. <laughs> yeah, beard aid. Um, I think when I was uh, recording the album and uh, I was sitting in the vocal booth and I was just playing on an acoustic guitar and I was like, oh, that's a cool riff. And then I heard Ronnie say from the control room who was watching me and he was like, he was giving me the thumbs up. He's like, yeah. And we wrote it into a song. So that was a great memory. What song was it? Uh, that turned out to be um, Between Who Two Hearts. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Simon, I mean, a lot of tours, a lot of records, a lot of moments, a lot of personal stuff. Yeah. Is there anything for you that really still resonates that you always yeah. go to? I mean, when, well, you know, talking of Holy Diver, I mean, we went out and um, when was it? 2006? Oh, I was at, at Roselands. I actually right, brought right. you guys on at that no, show no, no. in New York. This, this we was... played it in its entirety. You're talking about Holy yes. uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we played all of Holy Diver. Right. Holy Diver were live, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And that was a uh, thrill i mean um you know you got to give it up to Vinny. i mean his playing on that album was just stunning right it's just like whoa wait a minute and and the, to, to to have the chance to play like that you know that was something ronnie knew something special was going on there did Vinny come out to any shows and give you some shit and say simon you're doing it wrong he didn't come to the shows but he'd still give me shit yeah <laughs> He didn't call you or anything? No, 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 no. You missed that, Phil. That's not how I played it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm doing it my way this time. Sorry. <laughs> but it was such a thrill. I mean, it, it was, um, uh, some of it was medleyed into a drum solo. There was a guitar solo. Um, but it was just incredible playing that album the whole way through, you know? Yeah, there's a DVD of that. I remember because yeah. I believe it was shot at Roseland. I remember introing you guys at that. And yeah, it was yeah. very, very cool that, that you, it was a whole tour of playing Holy Diver, which was awesome. Yeah. Scott, for you, uh, give us a moment that really jumps out. Well, there's a couple, but I I don't want to. Uh, OK, the first one was I just uh, had gotten the call to go on a tour. I had done Strange Highways, but that was it. We were supposedly uh, Ronnie was going to go on. Uh, and then then I got the call that I was going to go on tour. So we went to Europe, all over Germany, came back, and I thought, okay, that's cool. I'll put it on my resume. I did a Dio tour. That's cool, you know? Um, and he drove me home in his Jeep right up to my doorstep, not a limo, not off you go. And, and I got out. I said, well, thanks for the tour, Ronnie. He said, are you kidding, kid? This is just the beginning. And I was like, oh, really? Yeah. And then uh, I was in some, going through some hard times at the time paying my rent. And I just thought I'd mention it to him on a Sunday night. And he <laughs> goes, uh, well, hold boy, on a boy. second. Yeah, I remember how to get to your house. And he drove up to my apartment, one bedroom apartment, and he had brought a bag of pennies. He had stashed because the banks were closed <laughs> Sunday night. <laughs> he goes, here you go. And I'm like, what is it? No, because he I guess I, I guess the rumor is that he did sort of collect pennies under his yeah, bed or he something did the, like uh, that. Thing. Yeah. And I'm like, well, pennies? <laughs> yeah. All right. And then there was the time. So you got that, yeah? Yeah. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was the I had my eye then on this, that. this was a heroic, <laughs> heroic moment I got to witness with Ronnie. And Vinny was there in, in Heaven and Hell, Black Sabbath, when uh, Tony hurt his back and we were sort of just got locked in because we, Tony, we couldn't play. So we had to cancel the show. And uh, and the promoter uh, got called the ambulances, ambulances and police, and they had blocked us in, barricaded us in, so we couldn't leave. They wanted us to do the show, and Tony was in in pain. Um, so eventually, the crowd was starting to get really crazy. So Ronnie uh, Geezer, I think Vinny and myself accompanied Ronnie up to the stage. The crew had already torn down; all the all the gear was gone. So he goes, I know I have to do this. So he marches up by himself in front of this rowdy crowd and says, started saying, hola, they're in Spain. He goes, uh, started singing Heaven and Hell by himself, a cappella, like 80,000 people that were throwing chairs turned into singing along with him. And that, that, that was a moment that I think they appreciated. And I appreciate it being there. Yeah, 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 he, yeah. He, yeah. he, cal he calmed him down. Hey, actually, real actually, I remember something too. I was uh, when, when I was at Ronnie's. I was looking after Ronnie's house when uh, 
uh, he was on the road with heaven and hell, right? And his house is, you know, not heavily fortified, but it's got big gates up and stuff. And um, I don't know, I'm feeding the cats in the kitchen or whatever. And um, I hear this. There's a knock at the front door and I'm going, how the fuck knows anyone knocking oh, yes. at the front door? I know everything. So I, I go down, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm next to the suit of armor and I'm looking through the spy hole and there's two cops. And I'm going, oh, okay. So I open the door and, and they goes, excuse me, sir, are you Mr. Uh, Ronald Padavana? I go, no. Um, what's the problem here? He says, oh, we can't talk to you. We just need to talk to Mr. Padavana. I said, well, you can't do that because he's on the road at the moment with uh, a, a band called Heaven and Hell. He's actually on his way back. He was flat in the air as they were asking me his question. So... You know, I, I thought you, you need to wait here because I need to call his manager. So I called Wendy and, and she says, who's at the door? You know, <laughs> Police, my God, don't let them in. You know, I'm like, what do you want me to do? Shoot them? You know, it's like. You know. So it, it ended up that they spoke to Wendy on the phone and I was just looking after the house, you know, I mean, so um, and the, what it was the reason they wanted to get a hold of Ronnie was because that there was a, a young man who was very, very upset. And he was up on a water tower um, up in Studio City. And above Studio City. Up above, way yeah, above way that. above, right? Yeah. So he wanted to, he was didn't want to live anymore. And the only person he wanted to speak to was, was the man on the Silver Mountain. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So Ronnie, you know, he'd been, where'd he come back from? Anyway, it's like a long haul flight. We, we had come back from, I was with him. At least <laughs> tell the rest I was on the other end of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So apparently, you know, the police met him at the airport or, and, you know, Ronnie's, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> so, um, but he said, oh, okay. He listened. He's, you know, Ronnie is just super smart. He goes, okay, I'll go see the guy. Let's go see him. Let's go see him. You know, so yeah, he was in the car with you, right? Or so I got. I got to get to a break, but in oh, the, oh, okay. in the in the in the, in the, the the whole end of the story is he talked him off the tower. He yeah, talked he him talked, off the tower. He talked saved him his life. Yeah, yeah, amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, Rowan, Simon, Scott. Thank you so much. Give him a round of applause, everybody. Thank you, well, it certainly smells like a rainbow. <laughs> And that certainly sounds like Sebastian Bach, ladies and gentlemen. On the All back right. Of the bus. And uh, we welcome Sebastian, and we have our, our latest uh, panel here to talk Dio. It's a panel, yeah. In the in the middle slot, representing my old TV show there. Yeah. Jeff Pilson is in the house, everybody. Hey, Jeff Pilson! <laughs> we found the one day Jeff wasn't on tour with Foreigner or <laughs> yeah, somebody. Yeah. He's constantly out there playing with somebody. And uh, on the end, a guy that I've also known for a very long time, bass player and singer from King's X, who have a new record coming, Doug Pinnock, everybody. Yeah, Doug Pinnock. Good to see you, bud. And don't forget KXM. And, yeah. Uh, well, you, Doug's resume, we could we could be yeah. here all day running down all the You're right. all the bands uh, uh, okay. that, that he's played with. But the big news is a new King's X record is finally coming, which is very exciting. But we're here to talk Dio. And starting with my friend Sebastian here, Sebastian and I had an unbelievable experience a few months ago where we went to Austin, Texas and helped launch the Dio documentary, which as Wendy told us earlier in the show, everyone will finally have a chance to see in September, yeah. which is really exciting. But Sebastian, your thoughts on the film having seen it. I mean, you and I sat with each other. We were elbowing each other we were crying we were oh my god this is incredible my thoughts on the film is kind of my thoughts on dio in general i'm here as a fan of dio and and if you could have told me when i was a little kid when i bought holy diver that on his 80th birthday we would be celebrating dio at the rainbow. <laughs> like, I can't, let's hear it for Dio's 80th birthday. Yeah, there you go. 
and 40 years of Holy wow. Diver. And Sebastian, as a, yeah. as a phenomenal singer yourself, I want to know, <laughs> I want to know what it was like for you as an aspiring vocalist to hear Dio for the first time. Well, um, I, 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 I bought all the Dio solo records right when they came out and I loved, and I bought heaven and hell when it came out, I was only 12 or something, uh, mob rules. But my first uh, tryout for like a real hard rock band, you know, I was very, very young and they said, well, well you can't sing. And I go, well, you haven't heard me try yet. <laughs> and I, I said, do you guys know the song children of the sea? And they go, you can't sing children of the sea by black Sabbath. And they were right. I couldn't, but I look, <laughs> but I look pretty good doing it. No, I gave it my best shot and I actually warbled my way through the song. Oh, I bet it's, it's better than you're giving yourself credit. for. Yeah, I was a kid. I was a little kid. But anyways, sing anything, if you man, could sing you a Ronnie James Dio song, you are getting the gig as the lead singer in the yeah. band. Yeah, for sure. That's a yeah. that's a high bar right there to yeah. do that, to, to get that gig for sure. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you actually played in Dio. We talked I earlier. Did. There was a there's a long list of people that have been a part of the Dio band. Talk about that experience and first getting to know him. Yeah. Well, you know, playing with Dio was actually a musical highlight and in some ways the most intense experience of my life musically. I mean, the band but with Vinny, myself, Tracy G, Scott and Ronnie, it was just an incredible experience. I mean, every night we went out there, we kicked ass. Uh, we listened to each other. We loved working together. We collaborate. When we wrote, we just had this magical chemistry. Everything about it was really life changing. And it, and it turned me around. I remember, in fact, the first time after I played with Dio, of course, Doc and got back together. And I remember the first rehearsal. I remember Don looked at me and he goes, wow, being a Dio was good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it was, man. Being in a band of that caliber really does something to you. Yeah. Uh, Doug, you, King's X, you told me just before we came on for this segment, you toured with Dio. Talk about that. Oh, yeah, I got I just got to say, first time I heard Ronnie was long live rock and roll. Yeah. And when I heard that voice, I wanted that voice. <laughs> he had he had such power and soul. He said I was just playing some of the music today and I didn't realize how much soul he had just from his heart. Yeah. Anyway, we toured with them a long time ago. I can't remember when it was, but uh Every night they'd go on stage, I would go on the side of the stage and watch the show right behind the monitors and the PA board or what or I mean, the PA the stacks, you know, talk about. And um, the third night, there was a chair there and Ronnie came in and he looked at me and said, I got the seat for you since you've been watching every night. <laughs> and, and I says, well, thank you. And he goes, your throne, sir. Wow. And, it was so cool. And every time he sang, it was like every night he was perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. He didn't flaw oh. anywhere. He it could was... be sick as a dog. He, just yeah, he, was. he was so perfect. Yes. And after every show, we got together and he'd roll a joint and put his tobacco yeah. in it and his weed in it. And I'd roll a joint with just tobacco or just weed. And we'd get <laughs> stoned and talk about life. And it was just so cool. I looked up to him. Was, that's that's my experience. I love that man. I, you know, I got a little story kind of like that. Yeah, please. Because I, I opened up for Dio at Sweden Rock, um, like about, <laughs> I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And I'm one of those singers like, uh, you know, Ronnie James Dio has a saying, if you got to warm up your voice, you shouldn't be a singer. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know. Because my voice gets better if I warm up. So, you know, I never drink before I go on stage. I don't smoke weed before I go on stage. I know you don't believe me, but but I don't. I never have. I go up there completely straight. So you are a pro, Sebastian. Well, 99 percent of the time. So so after my show, um, I'm drinking some wine. I'm smoking some bud, you know, after the gig at Sweden Rock. And there's a knock at the door. And I don't know if it was Wendy or one of her minions in the Dio organization. They said, Ronnie James Dio wants 
to speak to you. And I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, so I'm like, holy moly. So I go and Dio's headlining Sweden rock. And I walk in and he goes, Sebastian, have a seat right here. And he's doing all the stuff that I'm doing after the show, before the show. And I'm having wine and he's like, would you like some wine? And it's not cheap, you know, two buck Chuck. It's like rock star wine. And, and I'm going, when are you going on? He's like, I don't know, 45 minutes or something. I'm like, I mean, if he's, I, I would never do that, but it was so cool as, as to far as being like, he was so perfect. He didn't have to warm up. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't think about it. He just walked out there and was Dio. And, uh, and, and, you know, to this day, his music has lasted the test of time to the point where Stranger Things, which is the biggest show on TV, is like Dio everywhere you look. Like, you know, so it lives on and on and on. It is, it is amazing because you know, I've been talking to people this whole show that have had these experience with, with, experiences with Ronnie. And of course, the reason I'm here doing this is because I had so many experiences with him as well. And even though I'm not a musician, I will never forget, it was Madison Square Garden, the theater at Madison Square Garden. It was recent, uh, the, the heaven and, when he was doing Heaven and Hell, the last band. And it's just me and him. And we're sitting in his dressing room, just like you said, having a drink, having a smoke, whatever he's doing. And... His assistant comes in and says, Ronnie, 10 minutes to show. And I get up and I said, oh, let me let you go. Where are you going? I said, well, 10 minutes to show. You probably want to, you know, get. I've seen singers sing into towels and do calisthenics and all this shit. I said, well, you probably got to get ready. And he goes, what do you mean get ready? Sit down, finish your drink. And then he goes, like, 10 minutes later, Ronnie, showtime. He looks at me, he goes, come on, kid, because he called everybody kid. Come on, kid. <laughs> walk to the stage. He goes, go, go intro us. I walk out, intro Black Sabbath, which is insane. And here comes Ronnie singing seconds later, Neon Nights, like he warmed up for two hours. And I was like, that must make singers want to blow their brains out yeah. to be able to do that. <laughs> Doug, yeah. did you have similar? Did do you are you a big warm up guy or did you or what, what's your regimen? No, we don't warm up. I either. should just quit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The, the truth is, Ronnie actually did have a way of warming up. He was very smart when we would rehearse. We would always rehearse two weeks before a tour. Yeah. And he very conscientiously did this. He would spend the first five days. He'd start off kind of singing light. Right. He wouldn't sing the whole set, you know, the first day. He, or he'd sing most of it, but, you know, he'd work in each day by Thursday and Friday of the first week. He was he was into it. Friday, he went all out, yeah. like full on balls to the walls. Monday and two, uh, Saturday and Sunday, he relaxed, you know, got the rest of the voice. And then the next week, he'd sing it pretty much balls out the whole time, increasing intensity. And I've talked with him about that. That was how he warmed up, because once he did that with that two weeks of real solid foundation of getting your voice warmed up and opened up, he could go out to a show and kill. So it's kind of it was like an athlete almost getting ready to get ready. Exactly. For a match like that. yeah, that's, that's training. I, that's how we do it. We just start practicing and you just build yourself up. Don't kill yourself first rehearsal. Right. Just right. kind of build up to it. Always do yeah. something for tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys each have. And I asked the other people that have played with them or spent time with them, a personal memory that really stands out to you that was so important. Maybe, maybe some counsel he gave you, maybe some advice he gave you. Maybe it's just seeing a show and being blown away by something. Do you, do, Sebastian, go ahead. You okay? So uh, I, I got to open up for him at a place called the Bronco Bowl in Dallas, Texas. It's actually cool headlining Bach and Dio. And um, I was, well, of course, he went on last. And, uh, and uh, that was right when I got hired to be the first ever heavy metal singer on Broadway. I was Jekyll and Hyde. I was so excited because I could have a dressing room with a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, my God, you I'm definitely one? doing that. That is a big so, deal. It is. <laughs> so I was uh, all excited. And I told I went in to tell Ronnie J's deal. I go, oh, my God, I'm going to be on Broadway, man. And I was like, what? And I go, yes, I am going to be Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on Broadway. I go, what do you think of this, Ronnie? And he goes, Sebastian, I think this is very good for you. 
This is a chance for you to show other people that you are capable of more, that you have other sides to what you do, and you can go show the world all the different ways you can be on stage. And I go, right on, Ronnie. I go, Ronnie, would you ever do Broadway? He goes, no. <laughs> Are you he sure goes, it was just no goes, and not goes, no yeah. fucking way? No, he goes, Sebastian, no, I would not do Broadway. <laughs> this is very good for you. <laughs> I go, good for me? Why wouldn't you do it? I am very happy doing what I do. <laughs> and I have no intentions of doing thing, anything else. So be, go to Broadway, young man. <laughs> and I was like, I walked out of that room the most confused mother trucker. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, he was my buddy and I love him and it's his birthday. Let's hear, yeah. let's hear for Dia on his birthday. For sure. Jeff, how about you? Uh, okay, well, there's a lot, but um, the one that immediately comes to mind is, um, you know, I used to watch Ronnie very carefully as we would tour because he was the greatest band leader I've ever seen before and since i mean he is he was so great at not only running the band but running the whole organization on tour he was aware of everything he knew where every lighting point was he knew where exactly about the pa he knew about everything about the crew everything i mean he was just so amazing and you know one day um one day something went wrong during a sound check i don't remember what but i remember he he kind of got cross with somebody um, and you know, he, when he did, he would, some people got a little sensitive when he did because he could get pretty angry, but he always did it in such a way that the person would come back and work even harder and they wouldn't, they wouldn't take, you know, if they got a little sensitive at first, they caught the message because they knew he loved them. You know, I mean, seriously, they could feel that he genuinely supported them. So um, anyways, after that incident, I remember Ronnie and I were on an airplane sitting next to each other. And I asked him, I said, Ronnie, how do you do such an amazing job at controlling a band like this? And he said, you know what? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, because if you give 150%, 150% of the time, nobody will ever say anything. It'll make them work their fucking asses off. And by the way, man, you have that quality too. You can do it. And you know what? I have taken that advice so to heart and, you know, being, you know, I've been musical director for Foreigner for all these years. It has come in so handy. And I think of Ronnie, well, I think of Ronnie every day anyways, I really do. But that comes into play all the time. And thank you, Ronnie. Great advice. Yeah, I, I've said this many times. It's hard to believe that we Ronnie's been gone. What, is it 12? 12, 12 years, years Wendy. In 12 same. years, May 10th. Hard to believe that that's, but it does never, never does it feel that way because we're always doing events like this, celebrating him. And the music is so timeless that it's always there and it's always around. And we don't feel like uh, we, we ever lost him. Of course, we lose the personal connection, but the music truly does live forever. Doug, you got a story for us? Got a couple. Go ahead. I only we got want, some time. I only got one. It was really, it meant to me, a lot to me. You know, he he was very encouraging. He made you feel good about yourself. Yes, he was. And when I was talking about sitting on the uh, bench watching him sing, I said to him after one of the shows, I said, dude, you are so fucking good. And I went off onto all, everything we were saying. You went fanboy? Did you I go went fanboy? fanboy? And he looked at me and he said, I have to sing that way. I'm singing in front of you. You're a See, great yeah, singer. Yeah, that's him, man. That's and exactly what he did. My jaw went on the ground. Literally, I'm not bragging about nothing, but it was like, I'm, I'm sitting there watching him and he, and I grew up listening to him, you know? So... That's what I want to say about him. He had a way of making you feel good about yourself. He was a lover. He was an encourager. He was empathic. He understood. He knew, you know, how to. You know what? He knew about all of his fans, too. Yeah. I mean, we would sit there for hours after the show and sign autographs in front of the bus. I mean, even if it's, you know, 20 to below, he would stand there and sign every friggin' autograph. He had a way of making all the crowd feel like one person. Because that's him. And that's like, real. You, you that's talk, exactly it. It wasn't an act. No, that's it was not an act. And he was so cordial. 
It wasn't like Vince Neil. Hey, look at all that. Do you hear tonight? <laughs> like he didn't, he didn't, he didn't do raps like that. You he could spend like, a half hour with him. like, thank you very much for coming. We're all gonna have a great time tonight. We're so happy to be here. This is the concert that you were dreaming of. <laughs> and I would be like, I felt like I was at church or something. Like, I'm happy to be here in your presence, sir. But a, a little little fun fact: there used to be a record store in Walnut Creek, California, and my and my mom, the record exchange, and Kirk Hammett used to work there. And my grandma lived like two blocks from there, and I would walk there uh, every day in the summer. And um, I saw the poster for the barn show in Antioch on a telephone pole. And I think the opening band was Rough Cut. Am I right? Wow. And maybe Axe or Heaven ah. or Accept, maybe one of those. Heaven, yeah, Dio, oh, yeah. Heaven and Rough Cut. And I was only like 12 or 13 and I was, I was like, why are they playing in a barn? Because the name of the place was like the barn or something. Yeah, we talked about and that. And I earlier. totally remember that poster. Okay, next. No, sorry. No, no, that was the <laughs> that was the. If you get the Holy Diver reissue, which is out now, all the tour dates are listed. Wow. In the in the booklet, and that is the first date listed yep. on there. A, a little bad. That was Bach the, was staring at the at the poster, <laughs> that was trying the to get first there gig? somehow. First gig, really. Wendy had mentioned that a place called the barn. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was the first the first gig, gig wow. the first deal gig. Yeah, wow. absolutely. When was when was the yeah. first time, Peter? Doug? When wow. was the first time you saw you saw Ronnie live, like as a fan? Opening for him. Wow. Oh, you had not gone previous. <laughs> yeah, never. I, I, I just never got a chance to see him. Jeff, what about you? Uh, same thing. Opening for actually, I saw him jam at the country club one night with Rough Cut. <laughs> wow. Um, because I I was in the band that opened for Rough Cut that night. But um, well, what band was that? It was uh Randy Hansen. Oh wow! Whoa, really? Yeah yeah wow. yeah yeah awesome. yeah, yeah, oh, Randy, yeah. Randy the guy that does the Hendrix thing. Correct correct. Amazing. We, are, we were doing yeah. our own stuff at the time. Anyway um, but then I saw him uh when Doc and we did six shows with him at the end of '83. So that was probably the end of the Holy Diver tour, I'm guessing. So Doc and open for Dio early on. We did. Yeah, that was actually the fur. Well, no, I guess we'd done a few things before that. But yeah, that was that was a big thing for us. Yeah. And do you, do you remember how that went? Do you remember Absolutely. the experience? Of course. <laughs> did Doc and go down well? Did you guys go down well? Uh, well, opening? we weren't all that good back then. So um, <laughs> we were we were mediocre, you know, um, I think I will say, however, though, that the next year when we toured with Dio on the last their last in line tour and our whatever it was, Tooth and Nail tour. Um, my God, did we improve quick because of what we George and I would sit and watch him every night. You know, I don't recall the throne, but, you know, you, know, <laughs> you didn't, didn't get a throne. quite rate the throne. But uh, no, we would watch him every night. And honest to God, that was when Doc and actually started to become a, a decent live act. Was that when Doc and started rocking? <laughs> well, we, rocking. Well, we were rocking before that, but we started rocking better. Hard. Right. <laughs> Doug, how did King's X go down opening for Dio? They hated us. <laughs> Stop. Are you fucking kidding? <laughs> Did you? Was it really? Was it tough? It's always tough opening for anybody because we don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> right. We're just used to it. Actually, right? you know, we did a bunch of shows together and you actually got you guys went down great with us. Because, you know, you had the harmonies and all that stuff. That was in the Which band, Jeff? You've that been was in Dockin. Like, yeah, really? really? And it was in the 90s. Yeah, I remember doing some shows. I remember in particular Florida for some reason. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. But you guys festival, went down great. It rained. Panama City. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. God. Baz, when was the very first time you saw Dio as a fan? What band? I saw the huge sacred heart like like when he had like the dragon and the sword and at C C N E grandstand in toronto and like what you're saying the way he came out with the production and the show that was like 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 an over-the-top production <laughs> that must have cost some serious bucks I'm talking to Wendy Dio Wendy, right come here. Up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wendy, come back up yeah, here. Come that on that show, we this, have an open seat. We should get Wendy back. You up guys here. remember yes. the show yeah. Dio did where he slayed the dragon with the laser oh, beams yeah. and all that? Let's hear it for Wendy Dio. Wendy's back. Woo! 
Randy, we're doing so much yapping up here, and you're you're a few feet away, nodding, and we got to get you back on mic here. <laughs> Not on mic, please. What 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 do, what do you recall about the dragon, and where is it now? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, it was auctioned off somewhere. I don't wow. know. The dragon's head went somewhere. I don't <laughs> know where. Sebastian, how is that not in your house in your living room? I think it was in our wedding at the at the table. <laughs> that dragon's head. You know that a friend of right. mine ended up with the Sphinx. Oh, the Sphinx. He bought yeah. it from the auction, and it's oh. it's in his. He's yeah. got a like a well, museum. We, we, we had everything stored for so many years, so many years, and then suddenly I said, you know what? I think like two years ago, we got to get rid of this stuff. This is wow. just like whatever. And so we did a big auction at Julian's and we got rid of all the stuff. Uh, the sake, one of the one of the nights, because there were two nights that had laser jewels in say in the Sacred Heart Tour. One of them went to a museum in Florida and the other one went to another museum somewhere else. I don't know where wow. they went, but there was so much, there was a big spider. Um, <laughs> that, that Sacred Heart tour that had that was in, huge work in Drawbridge 18 and what, breathing dragon wasn't it the first show like with a real working laser thing yeah right? we had lasers we had a whole truck for a whole semi full of lasers a actually they had lasers before Sacred Heart because they had them on the last yeah, line had, tour yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But then we, we had really a and, lot and that was the almost the earliest that was definitely the earliest heavy rock band to use lasers and they cost a fortune because yeah, Ge genesis so cool. used them before that but then yeah because they were very lights right yeah i remember ed aswax was the guy that owned them and they would cost a fortune he lives in hawaii now probably on all the money he made from us <laughs> <laughs> he's on the beach having a cocktail thanks ronnie <laughs> he's celebrating dio's birthday too exactly, exactly right. <laughs> Wendy, I have to now that you're back up here, I've asked these three guys this story, but I mean, and this is such a a massive question for you, having spent most of your life with Ronnie, both married to him and of course professionally as his manager. But is there for you a singular moment that in his whole career and your whole time with him that really stands out as something that you'll never forget, like a really special, special moment, whether it was Personal, if you want to share it, or professionally, or both. Okay, so Ronnie always wanted to play Madison Square Garden. It was very, very important to him because he had walked down there in Elf and other bands and always looked at it and said, one day I want my name in lights up there. Okay, so finally we got the offer, Madison Square Gardens, or what's the other one in New York? Uh, Meadowlands. Meadowlands. Meadowlands offered twice as much money. But Ronnie said, no, I want to play Madison Square Garden. So he played there with Sabbath before, but he wanted his own name up in lights at Madison Square Garden. So this is before camp, before the internet, before the phones or anything. So we go there and his name's in lights like that. And he said, oh, Wendy, take a photo. And I said, I forgot the camera. Oh. <laughs> and I did not live that one down, do you know? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, that came wow, back to haunt wow, you. Wow. Probably 10 years later, he would bring oh, that I'm one so back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing that in all this talk about Ronnie that we're doing, the, the thing that maybe gets lost for people that didn't know him personally like we all did is he could be a ball buster and he <laughs> had a sense of humor. Oh. I was I took the brunt of it a lot of times. He'd love to wind me up. <laughs> so that and that was a lot. People, I think I think fans look at Ronnie and, you know, the horns and the, you know, the, the imagery, but the guy himself was not only a wonderful, wonderful person. I used to say all the time when people used to ask me about Ronnie, I used to say, you know what, as great of a singer as he is, he's an even better person. That's yeah. what kind of person he is. He really was. You, you guys realize that Ronnie Dio's first single came out in the year 1959. Yeah. Is that crazy? Which we saw in the documentary. Like, think, think about that. Yeah. And there's footage in the movie yeah. of him singing from that single. Yeah. And I said, I said to uh, Wendy, why don't you release that? And she goes, Ronnie would whip my ass if I put that out. <laughs> I go, but, but he can't whip my ass now. No. And it's coming out. <laughs> it is. On the soundtrack. Oh. On the soundtrack to the for, the, for the movie. That's great. It's, and a, an angel is missing is on the soundtrack for the uh, Warner Brothers uh, 
Because I, I can listen to Ronnie sing the phone book, you know, like I want to hear all I want to hear all of his recordings, like everything. Did you come to the role? OK, the, the story right. that Wendy told about Madison Square Garden is where the book ends. The yeah. autobiography right. ends yeah. Rainbow yeah. in the Dark. Yeah, it ends with that with that culmination because of that dream. He started the book. Um, he got the idea from the book was there was a journalist that asked him at Madison Square Gardens, where did you start? Where did you get your beginning? And he said, oh, I was going to say the same old thing. And then I suddenly said, wait a minute, where did I start? And then that goes back and it ends because he says, I got to go now. I'm on stage. Yeah. Oh. If you guys have not gotten the autobiography, it's incredible. So yeah. be sure to, to pick that up as well. As Wendy mentioned earlier in the show, the film... Finally, everybody's going to be able to see it in September in theaters initially, and then it'll roll out from there. And of course, the Holy Diver reissue, which we've been talking about here for the last two hours, is out now. And it, the remix is phenomenal. The original version, of course, is still flawless. And all the extras packaging is just simply amazing. So check that out. It's available in stores right now. Um, we're pretty much out of time. We got to wrap it up here. So thank you, Sebastian. Thank, Thank you, Jeff Eddie. Wilson. Thank, Thank you. you, Doug Pinnock. Thank you, Wendy Dio. Say, boy.